Ladies and gentlemen, everyone around and in between, this is Debate Sensei NFA edition, uh, NFALD edition, where we talk about things relevant to competitive NFALD Lincoln Douglas debate. Um, and with us, we have Dr. Justin Kirk from uh, University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Thank you very much, Dr. Kirk. And uh, we also have from Western Kentucky University, Chad Meadows, the director of debate. Thank you very much, Chad, both of you for being here. Thank you so much. All right. So I'm Jared Kabika Miller. I am also a debate coach, professor of communications. Um, I, I rarely introduce myself and I was told that I should. Uh, so this episode, we are talking about uh, key authors. And so this is a, a very interesting comparison because I did a similar episode with the CETA debate and the authors that y'all submitted uh, had very little overlap. There was one, we'll just briefly, was Vincent Intondi. And so now his writings uh, about the intersection of race and nuclear weapons um, are intriguing to me. Um, so maybe you, you may have sold a book between the three of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But what we're going to do is that uh, I solicited suggestions from, from both uh, Justin and Chad and put them together. And so we will uh, just kind of go through as many as we're, as time allows. All right. So I'll throw it to you, Chad. Why don't we start with one of your picks? Awesome. Um, do you, do, do you care which one we go with first? No, no, it's, it's, yeah. Cool. Be your choice. Go for it. Uh, I think we can start with Nina Tannenwald. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, Nina Tannenwald is a, uh, lecturer at Brown university. Um, and she's uh, previously from their uh, Watson Institute. Um, and she wrote a book in 1999 um, about the nuclear taboo. Um, so the nuclear taboo is basically the lack of nuclear weapon use against other nation states mm -hmm. since 1945, you know, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and basically she's exploring what sort of like has constituted the nuclear taboo why uh given so many conflicts since 1945 haven't we seen more nuclear wars uh and she comes to basically like two conclusions uh the first one is that uh we often overestimate the role that nuclear deterrence has played in preventing uh nuclear weapon use and then mm. two um that there is a um norm that has been created in international relations. You, it's not written down anywhere. You can't find it in any treaty, but there is a normative uh, sort of like prohibition against nuclear weapons. Um, okay. And it's pretty relevant to our topic, but yeah. I think what has become very relevant is sort of like an offshoot of that research, which is her conclusion, which is that if nuclear deterrence has not been responsible for the nuclear taboo, then we should not have declaratory policies with oh, okay. yes that we should ever use nuclear weapons first in a conflict. And oh, so okay, got one it. Of the more prolific writers of the NFUF. Um, got it. If you, for instance, are you know getting started in LD or you're just kind of wanting to understand the AF literature of 75% of AFs, yeah. <laughs> find Nina Tannenwald's article uh, in the Texas Security Review or the okay. of it, uh, in, I think, 2019. And you have the gist of 75% <laughs> of the affirmative. She makes all the arguments in the most succinct way possible. Um, and so I wanted to include here her because though she is, I think, a little more mainstream in her thinking than most of the authors that we chose, just reading some Tannenwald would get some novices and some JVs up to speed really, really fast. So All right. read Tannenwald and you'll understand <clears throat> what most of the debates are about. There we go. All right, starting off strong. Okay, so uh, Justin, who would you say we should go to next? Um, so I'm going to start with Amir Lupovici or Lupovici. I'm not really sure how to pronounce their name. Um, okay. But uh, most of my authors are from a critical perspective on the topic. Um, Amir is a lecturer in the Department of Political Science at Tel Aviv University. Mm. Um, and his work centers mostly on 
the criticism of deterrence as a concept in international relations. Um, Lubavici's work kind of looks at why countries choose to embrace a deterrence strategy. And in particular, his latest book, The Power of Deterrence, kind of looks at why the United States and Israel use the forms of deterrence that they use um, mm. and why deterrence does or does not seem to work in certain situations. And in particular, he's considered, um, he's kind of concerned with this question that keeps coming up in the nuclear literature, which is if nuclear weapons are so powerful and dangerous, why have they never been used? Um, right. And if deterrence works, why are so many people terrified that it might fall apart, right? So he's kind of grappling with these kind of central questions of international relations theory, how nuclear weapons relate to defense and assurance and deterrence. And if you look at the Nuclear Posture Review, deterrence is one of the three major roles of nuclear weapons um, that they play for the United States. In fact, I would argue, and I think Chad might agree with me, that deterrence is the primary role that nuclear weapons play. Mm -hmm. And so unpacking how deterrence functions to persuade adversaries that were serious and also persuade allies that were serious um, and, and kind of taking a critical approach to that. So what sorts of investments are made um, into countries we think are powerful deterrents? What sorts of kind of commitments do we have to weapon systems? Sort of mm -hmm. like with the, the discussion we had last time about ICBMs, these kind of like um, commitments to maintaining the ICBM force come mm -hmm. from a deterrent posture from the Cold War that isn't necessarily connected to status quo nuclear arsenals or nuclear um, engagement in the status quo. And Lubavitchi wants to kind of unpack how deterrence functions vis-a-vis -vis these kind of legacy weapon systems, new weapon systems like AI or drones, um, and, and, and how we kind of deploy deterrence in international relations theory because so many affirmatives talk about a breakdown in deterrence but don't really ask why deterrence is being held on to as a concept by all these military planners or what relevance it has um, to kind of the way we formulate security theory or ir theory um, and how we think about securitization it kind of sounds like there might be a little bit of a little bit of tension between tannenwald and Lupavice, would you? Uh, absolutely, ab absolutely, okay. yes. Okay. Because um, I think a lot of the reasons why Tannenwald thinks that no first use um, would be a good policy is because of things like conventional deterrence. And and Lupavice's mm -hmm. critique applies broadly equally to both conventional and nuclear forms of deterrence, right? It's more of a critique of the concept of deterrence and less yeah. a critique of the weapons used in deterrence. Okay. Yeah, okay. Tannenwald is uh, kind of like positioning her in the literature, I would kind of like put her alongside a whole host of um, experts in IR that I think rose to prominence during the Obama administration. Okay. Um, and we're kind of like the architects of um, advocating for a nuclear posture that would de-emphasize the role of nuclear weapons, but would not fundamentally change the dynamics of what the military sets out to do, which is, to have big bad weapons that convince our adversaries to not do things we don't want them to do and convince our allies that we've got their we've got their back the whole discussion kind of reminds me uh, i didn't mention them uh but joseph nye he has an older book in 99 mm. um called on nuclear ethics and he has a concept called the the usability paradox and it basically the paradox is that in order to achieve deterrence you have to demonstrate that you are very likely to use and able to use nuclear weapons, but the goal of deterrence is to never use nuclear weapons. So yeah. <laughs> you have to prepare constantly as if you will use them in order to not use them. And balancing that paradox is sort of like, according to I, the primary goal of nuclear weapons policy. Um, and some people come down on the, you know, we should just sort of like in a very conventional sense, change what we, what instruments are used for deterrence and right. some, I think are a lot more in depth in the way that they interrogate why is deterrence a thing yeah it, like the, the the old paradox is like for, you know for peace prepare for war mm -hmm. um, right yeah. absolutely all right uh Chad let's throw it back to you what do we who do you got next on the roster yeah uh let's up Ray Atchison all right uh, so Ray Atchison, um, I believe their pronouns are they, them. Uh, okay. I wanted to mention that because I've seen, uh, various pronouns being used for their, um, uh, identity and debates. Uh, but as I was looking it up, I saw they, them, um, they, um, are 
uh, the leader of the WILPF, which is um, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and they're the director of Reaching Critical Will, and they advocate for disarmament and nuclear abolitions uh, in the United Nations, and they, they write a lot about the TPNW, uh, which is the Treaty for Non-Use of Nuclear Weapons. Um, and so a few things that I find interesting about them, um, one of which is that um, there's a lot of authors who are writing about you know, disarmament. Uh, there aren't very many authors who are writing about it from the perspective of someone who is not a scholar, but is like working in the field of disarmament, trying to oh. get countries to okay. like remove their nuclear weapons and has helped successfully negotiate a fairly large treaty uh, that most of the non-nuclear weapon states have signed on to, uh, to prohibit nuclear weapons. Um, and they, I think, do a really good job of examining the dynamics of the discourse that surrounds disarmament movements and what perspectives are more or less likely to be convincing and to capture um, the full scope of nuclear violence. And I think some of the authors that um, Dr. Kirk's going to bring up also talk about this, but uh, you know, there's several different descriptions of what you might call nuclear violence that happens not on the level of interstate conflict, but happens in the nuclear planning phase, the nuclear testing phase, mm -hmm. the development, the mining, et cetera, right? Uh, I'll throw out some authors just for the benefit of our folks. Uh, Von Munster, a pretty good author on this topic, has an article. Uh, they call it the nuclear color line. Um, mm -hmm. Another author uh, that I'm going to mention, uh, Nick Ritchie, calls mm -hmm. it of altern uh, hegemonic resistance to nuclear weapons. Um, yeah. But yeah, so Atchison and Ritchie um, are, and we can talk more in depth about Ritchie, but they both are essentially looking at the 20, from 2010 until now, uh, and in 2010, that was when um, the non-nuclear weapon states began having conferences um, and meetings to sort of like voice their dissatisfaction with the NPT treaty, which is previously the the biggest uh, non-proliferation treaty, um, right? They're they're voicing their dissatisfaction with the NPT, um, and they start having their own meetings. They start having their own discussions about what a nuclear weapons treaty for disarmament would look like. And Richie and Atchison are primarily writing about what was different about that conversation than the one that was made up of the nuclear weapon states uh, who all signed the NPT, which also is technically a, dis a disarmament treaty, right? Right. Like, that, that's the weird thing is like, technically we're all supposed to be disarming nuclear weapons. We all <laughs> signed a treaty to that effect. Um, and so uh, another term uh, that might be helpful for research uh, is the sort of like consensus, the nuclear consensus. Mm. So there's a false consensus in international relations with regard to disarmament uh, where nuclear weapon states kind of wink wink agree that we need to get rid of nuclear weapons but have done anything but and especially you know in the era after you russia's invasion of ukraine uh chinese nuclear modernization america's nuclear modernization uh are now increasing nuclear weapons um and so i think you know Atchison and richie are um both great authors to uh, sort of like study the nuclear disarmament movement. And there's a lot of applications there. There's critique literature on the AFA neg. Okay. There's movements related arguments on the AFA neg. And they kind of toe the line enough, you know, to where they can kind of fit into some topical debate. They can kind of fit into some not topical debate. Okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, they've been read in, in different ways. And so I think those are, I really like both those authors. And uh, we've gotten a lot of a mileage out of uh, out of those two. Okay. All right, Dr. Kirk, back to you. Um, so we're going to turn turn critical again, um, and we're going to go with Eco Day. Okay. Um, who is the Elizabeth C. Small Professor and Chair of English and Critical Social Thought at Mount Holyoke, um, and 
their work focuses on kind of the intersection of Asian identity, African identity, settler colonialism, and ontology. Um, mm -hmm. But a particular article that they wrote in 2022 called Nuclear Anti-Politics and the Queer Art of Logistical Failure um, has been making the rounds in both circuits um, and is a quite good article on the relationship between nuclear weapons and kind of uh, settler structures and how um, the nuclear weapons industry and its kind of imprint on societies um, magnifies, mimics, accelerates the settler colonial project. So for example, um, one of the ways that it does that is through um, things like mining and testing regimes. Um, nuclear mining occurs primarily on indigenous land. Um, okay. Here in the United States, um, the most of the mining happens in places like New Mexico and Arizona, if you know anything about those right. lands. They're primarily either federal or indigenous lands. Um, and many of the, the groups in those areas kind of say even the federal lands they're doing mining on um, are sacred traditional lands. Typically you mine out of a mountain. Mountains are traditionally seen in those um, kind of communities as uh, sacred places. Uh, additionally, their work kind of looks at the way in which um, the kind of movements that folks like Ray Atchison and Richie are talking about um, have failed to actually persuade the bigger countries to disarm, right? And, and how we then grapple with this failure that has occurred when the message and the argument seem to be overwhelmingly persuasive, um, but the nations and states that control these weapons and control these industries um, have failed to kind of acquiesce to the demands of the people um, to dismantle these weapons or dismantle these industries. And so uh, Day's kind of work looks a lot at kind of how... Um, politics, nuclearism, and um, kind of settler structures interact with one another, produce kind of agency and activism um, at the at the citizen space. Mm. Okay. All right. That one was, yeah, uh, I was looking them up. So they're at, where's Mount Holyoke? Um, I'm not really sure where Mount Holyoke is. Huh. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, um, <laughs> it is in South Hadley, Massachusetts. Okay, that's a good like. Oh, that's a, lots of lots of good leaf peeping this year. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we don't get much of that out in California. I got one tree out front that, that changes color. All right, we're going back. Chad, who you got? I think you got Matthew Coslow up there. Oh, I didn't. Okay, I didn't. <laughs> I don't mind him there at all. Okay, okay. I, I, All right, so mouse slip. let's do a jarring <laughs> turn. <laughs> <laughs> the content of the literature. Um, so Matthew Coslow is maybe the furthest you can get from day. <laughs> oh, really? Um, okay. So Matthew Coslow um, is a graduate uh, of the, uh, the Strategic Studies. Uh, let, me, let me look at the exact name of it the Defense and Strategic Studies Program at Missouri State University. Okay. Um, and uh, for my policy folks, um, so you know, you, you don't read critiques, um, you're looking for policy stuff and you're looking for neg arguments and you're like, you know, when I Google things, all I see are, you know, Global Zero, the bulletin, you know, like I can't find anybody who's just like, nukes are good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the um, the Defense and Strategic Studies School, uh, it is sponsored by Missouri State University, though, from what I read, they actually take classes in Fairfax, Virginia. Um, <laughs> they uh, have primarily produced a set of scholars who vigorously defend nuclear deterrence uh, in the most traditional sense. So... Okay. Uh, Matthew Coslow um, is, is in a lot of NFU debates uh, because they probably write the best cards um, on why a NFU would not be credible. Um, mm. So the credibility of the NFU basically relates to whether or not if the United States declares a first no first use policy, right. would other states believe us? Right, right, you know, right, right. advantages ostensibly rely on other states believing 
and, and, and the follow through of our no first use declaratory stance. Coslow has really, you know, like several and pretty strongly worded evidence that we would not be believed. Um, and <clears throat> Coslow also makes a series of arguments that sort of just defend traditional nuclear deterrence. So I would, I would, I would sort of like group Coslow uh, and and his ilk into the nuclear competition school. Um, okay. So the nuclear competition school are the folks who, you know, usually through some qualitative and semi uh, quantitative studies um, have suggested that the stronger nuclear arsenal the United States has, the more likely we are to prevent adversaries from taking actions contrary mm. to the interests of the United States and the more likely we are to convince our allies, especially allies that are under the American nuclear umbrella, um, to not take matters into their own hands and develop right. their own uh, capabilities for defending themselves. Um, so, you know, countries under the American nuclear umbrella, we're talking, at least in debate at, at this point, primarily South Korea, Japan, and then in the CETA circuit, and then I suspect the elite circuit will follow Australia right. um, okay. are uh, countries that are under the American nuclear umbrella, don't have super strong, or in the case of South Korea and Japan and maybe Australia, I don't know, uh, don't have any nuclear weapons. Um, and so um, they are uh, sort of like under that umbrella. Uh, Koslo uh, also like, you know, like honestly, like any argument that NFU authors have made in support of NFU Coslow has an article saying it's wrong. Oh, really? okay. <laughs> I'm honestly convinced that like he, he might just like stalk the <laughs> whoever writes NFU and just go, oh, there's another argument in support. I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot that down. But you know, I think Coslow and what he represents um, is like an essential piece for folks who aren't doing critical debate. Uh, mm. So a big suggestion I make is group people into schools. Right. In my okay. experience thus far, every graduate of that Missouri State Defense and Strategic Studies school wrote a thesis that was like nuclear deterrence is good. Um, okay. And so that's like a, a school that I would check out. Uh, it's a pretty prestigious school, actually. Um, and they've got a lot of professors that are uh, previous big wigs in the military, um, big wigs in the Department of State, um, people who worked in administrations. Uh, well, and and Matthew Coslow represents the conventional perspective. Right, right. I was going to say Coslow actually wrote a really good white paper for the National Institute for Public Policy back in 2021 that kind of combines all these anti-NFU arguments into a single document. Mm -hmm. um, some of the like other articles that Coslow has written are a little bit more rhetorically forceful, but the okay. the the policy paper has all the answers in it to any NFU app. Like I was reading through this a couple of weeks ago and I was like, wow, there's an answer to this. There's an answer. I mean, so if mm -hmm. you're looking for what's the NFU case neg going to look like, Chad's absolutely right. The Coslo will line by line most of the claims that like Neiman Tannen Wald makes. Okay. Okay. That's a, yeah, that's good stuff. I mean, you got to fill in those gaps. Sometimes you just have that critic. You got to sort of adapt to them, you know? Well, yeah, I think one I'm, of the I'm always cool. really um, sympathetic to the, you know, to, to, to the conventional debater. That's what I was, you know, like I <laughs> in the critique a little bit. Um, but for the most part, you know, when I was doing my business, I was just blitzing through case arguments, decides and counter plans. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes you got to. And, and I think the point that uh, Dr. Kirk makes is really good. Even if there are some articles by some of these folks that are published in some somewhat unsavory places, mm -hmm. um, let's say like you know Heritage, War on the Rocks, whatever, mm -hmm. and in, and in those places they have not really substantiated their argument in like a super good way, they have also generally made those arguments in a much more balanced and mm -hmm. academic way in right. a in, in an academic source, and so I think people would also be uh, would 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 do themselves a benefit to like, if they see an article that's just sort of like, you know, on a website, find that author and find their academic work. And I think you'll get a better understanding of the, the actual insight behind it. All right. 
So let's go on back, Dr. Kirk. Yeah, um, this is an article that I found about a month ago that I think Chad saw that we were reading. Uh, a gentleman named John Stremus, who is the director of American Studies and Culture at mm. Washington State. Um, and John actually has a book that's coming out. I don't. There's no date on it, but I'm hoping it's okay. before the end of the season um, called The Ends of Times, Race and Nuclear Apocalypse. Oh. Um, but actually, the article that I was able to find is an article called Nuclear Threat as Race Hatred. Um, oh. And this article has the best kind of inroads to the Afro-pessimism literature that I've been able to find on nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. um, and Stremus's argument is fundamentally one of, like, the reason nuclear weapons exist now is because of an agreement that we call the racial contract. And um, Chad can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I think from the reading of Streamus's argument, this agreement is kind of an unspoken agreement that um, reformism, it should be the avenue by which black folks try to achieve equality. Um, mm. Burning it down is unacceptable. Um, and, and in exchange for that, we will do things like provide you with defense through nuclear weapons, right? And Tandi goes through a lot of these kind of like contradictions in their book on the civil rights movement and the connection to the anti-nuclear movement. Um, but Streamus really kind of elevates the rhetorical force of this argument a little bit in their article to talk about how it's not just that, but the actual leverage of deterrence policies or the use of nuclear weapons to, to leverage threats against countries is itself a form of anti-Black violence. Um, that it is okay. based in a racial hatred um, towards Japanese people. John Streamus is an immigrant from Japan. Um, I think he's a product of a biracial family in Japan. Um, and so kind of filters that through the only time nuclear weapons have ever been used is in an act of overt racism against a people um, that mm -hmm. the United States treated as less than human. And so we cannot view these weapons as anything other than racialized weapons. They were designed for a racialized purpose. They're maintained through structures of racial hierarchy. And Streamus's kind of conclusion is that um, the racial contract between like states and minorities within those states are the thing is the thing that upholds the nuclear weapons industry, not necessarily things like the logic of deterrence or arms manufacturers, but it's actually this kind of unspoken agreement um, between the people of states and the states. Um, that we're not going to try and overthrow your government um, and you'll protect us from external violence. Um, I think this links up a lot with some of the stuff that Day is arguing as far as like the queer politics of failure, a lot of the stuff that Atchison is talking about with disarmament movements. Um, I think Atchison probably has kind of a sequencing question that's a little bit okay. different um, than Streamus does. Atchison would probably argue that the material change of disarmament has to precede kind of these rhetorical or symbolic moves, um, whereas mm. Streamus would come at it from much more of the kind of rhetorical or discursive perspective. Um, that the ways we talk about nuclear deterrence, the ways we talk about nuclear war are highly racialized um, and that we can't actually have a disarmament discussion until we recognize the ways in which race and racism implicate our discussions about nuclear policy. Um, and, and if Streamus is right about their theory, there is no discussion of nuclear policy that isn't structured around white supremacy or anti-blackness in some shape. Um, and so that's a prerequisite to kind of Atchison's arguments about why we need to um, build a bigger disarm movement and things like that. Um, so would you say this as far as I can tell, that's the first real article they've written on nuclearization, but it is going to probably be a big part of the book that they're writing. Do you think that that some of the authors that like these critical authors that you're finding favor more uh, on the affirmative side? Do you find yourself using them more in writing critical affirmatives or critical negatives? We've used them for both. Um, okay. I do think that they're definitely more useful for critical affirmatives, given the negative yep. state action in the topic. Um, I think the most effective kind of critical arguments I've seen so far this year have all been on the negative side or the affirmative side of the debate. The psychoanalysis okay. critique affirmative that we were talking about earlier. Um, one of our debaters is reading the streamist stuff as an affirmative. Um, you know, I think I think just generally given the kind of confluence of disarmament is a negative state action and a lot of these authors would fundamentally agree with the idea that we should get rid of nuclear weapons, right? Um, they they yeah. kind of agree with the thesis of the resolution. Um, they just might disagree about the ways we might do it. I think that makes it perfect for affirmative um, research. Do, do any of the critical authors engage with the more conventional policy authors or vice versa? Does that ever happen? Did that they're actually calling each other out? 
a little bit, but I think in a lot, in a large sense, a lot of these groups are writing in kind of two different spheres. A lot of the critical right. authors write in much more humanistic journals. Um, for example, the extremist articles in the Journal of Hate Studies. I'm pretty right. sure Nina Tannenwald doesn't pick up the Journal of Hate Studies, <laughs> uh, and neither does Scott Coslow, right? Like, so I think that like right. the, the conventional deterrence versus non-deterrence people aren't really reading the stuff that the critical authors are reading. And the critical authors may be reading the stuff that Tan and Walter Kossler are, are writing, but they're only using them as kind of a, a an artifact to examine, not necessarily right. a I'm responding to what Nina Tannenwald is saying, right. but more so Nina Tannenwald is evidence that my claims are true about the kind right. of racialized nature of deterrence theory, right? Um, so I don't think okay. that there's necessarily a conversation going on. But again, that's what debate's great about is putting these schools into conversation yeah. with each other that don't normally that's, talk. That's it. So my big suggestion would be, um, and it's, uh, we have a debater that's also doing extremist affirmative as well. Um, and we kind of had that problem the first weekend out was we were like, we it felt as if A, there was like, really easy for like the negative to like clash with us, but not easy for us to clash with the neg. Um, uh, because like, like the, the arguments that like nuclear weapons are good do somewhat clash with the arguments, even from a critical perspective that are against nuclear weapons. Right. But streamists, like Dr. Kurt pointed out, isn't, going through like a laundry list of like reasons why like nuclear deterrence isn't real or nuclear deterrence is bad right like they're they're ready for it. so what we found was really successful was taking some of the folks that i mentioned that are in that middle ground i would say who are kind of like studying nuclear disarmament as a movement from rhetorical and cultural perspectives so uh some names we've already gone over richie we yeah. went over atchison uh, another one would be um, Kajol of Eggland. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, this is our whole app. <laughs> These are the people that we all like. <laughs> uh, Kajol of Eggland uh, is in that similar vein with um, Atchison uh, in um, examining nuclear disarmament movements. And those people that are examining nuclear disarmament from a cultural and rhetorical perspective have also done a little bit more work to sort of like helpfully engage with some of the just like conventional nuclear weapons good scholarship mm -hmm. that I think helps make a whole affirmative. And this is something that I'm noticing is in uh, LD and especially in policy. If you look at the policy docs and then we've gone to a couple of policy tournaments this year, the AFs have more cards that are about nuclear weapons mm -hmm. than traditionally see in like a non a critical affirmative okay there's, there's more cards that are just like directly engaging with right. like because like if you look at the nc's like against like critical ads everyone's reading a deterrence da right like mm -hmm. basically like the four off that everyone in policy reads against critical ads are they read g they read a disarm counter plan they read a deterrence da and then they read some sort of cap k right mm -hmm. so like and some people even still read like assurances da right so if the baggage is there that you still kind of link to the negative offense, you need some stuff that's in the conventional literature to help the AF and the 2AC kind of get back some of that offense. All right. This was awesome. It was fascinating. Um, I think that like the, the, I liked how some of the, 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 the extreme, and uh, uh, at least on this topic, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like uh, we're, we're represented. So that was, that was excellent. Thank you uh, both Dr. Kirk, Chad Meadows. Um, so we will come back and we'll talk about other stuff uh, re relevant to NFALD. All right. All right, everybody. See you then. Uh, here we go.